Good morning, friends. I'm Sandra Clay. I'm the pastor at Cooks United Methodist Church, and I am glad to start this March with you. Uh, oh, March as in the month, but I guess we could also uh, look at uh, tomorrow and the beginning of Lent as a March of sorts too, as we move closer to the cross and take time to be thoughtful and intentional. Um, about this journey that we have agreed to uh, by taking the name of Christ, uh, by placing our faith in Him. It's so good to see everybody today. There's Jean and Charlene and all of our faithfuls, Edna and, and Ruth. And hey, Joyce, good morning to you. It's so good to see everybody. Good morning, Gail. Um, I, I've, I've said a couple of times here in the last uh, week, week and a half, that I, I know that this is not the most exciting uh, part of Scripture to read, that it, it's awfully tempting for me, I confess, uh, to look for the little nugget that we could pray over and think about and take as a proverb or a promise that we could hang on to. But this is included, the census taking and the responsibilities um, of caring for the tent of meeting or the tabernacle, the sanctuary, whatever you want to call it, are all important too. They're included in the canon of scripture um, for a reason. Do, will we know specifically what those reasons are? I think there are too many for us to even count. And so it may not be um, as important. We may not hold it as important for ourselves. We may also uh, not know, quite know what to do with it and what to learn from it. But y'all, we're going to be faithful and just keep on keeping on. We're going to keep on reading and trying to find um, God in the middle of it. This is God's story, and that's why it's our story, too. So we're going to uh, jump right on in uh, today and uh, to do this. So for those of you who are, um, are new to us, hey, Denise. Uh, for those of you who are new uh, to this whole thing, we're reading chronologically through Scripture, and you think this is rough, you just wait till we get to some of the uh, prophets and their um, less than exciting words to the people of God. But we're we're following through uh, in um, the chronological story of the Bible. So again, for those of you who are new, I, we want to suggest... I want to suggest something like this. There's a chronological Bible that makes it really easy so that when we are at a day when there are readings from multiple books, um, chronicles, for instance, um, uh, though the work, when, it was, when, it, when we think it was recorded, is a date of its own, it corroborates some things that we learn early on or later. And so there will be days when we have um, words or passages from one, two, or three different books. This just makes it a little bit easier. And there is a handy-dandy little timeline. You could find one on the internet uh, if you'd like to. A timeline of kind of how things uh, begin when the kings began to reign, uh, what uh, is ha happening. Uh, we know that we are around 14... Uh, around 1445 or 46 uh, is the Exodus, and 45, then, remember, we're descending in years as we get close to the coming of Christ. It's all because of Jesus, the way we measure time. So, um, and we know that at the beginning of Numbers, we read that all of this census taking is happening two years uh, one month and 15 days after the exodus from Egypt. So they've been parked here, camped at the base of Mount Sinai for quite some time. Don't you know that was a welcome respite? As bad as it was, 
uh, wondering where you were going to get water and where food was coming from, trusting in the promises of God. Don't you know their feet were getting weary? There's going to come a time when God reminds them, though, you spent all this time wandering in the desert. Your shoes didn't wear out. I provided for you all the time. Those are the things that we need to hang on to because that's not told in the story as we read it. So here we go. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, those first four chapters of the book of Numbers. God calls for a census so that um, you, you know where you are, not just at the base of this mountain where God has shown himself, not just around uh, the tent of meeting or the tabernacle with God in the very center of what they're doing. Let's know who we are by starting with how many we are. And, uh, and the writer here of Numbers, many credit that to Moses, um, we begin with the head of the family. So we know it's not Reuben, but it's all of those who have descended from Reuben now. It's not just Simeon. There's somebody else that's the head of the family. That's why it's important for us to not lose sight that we're, we're still talking about the same 12 tribes that God called to himself from the very beginning. Here's the crazy thing, though. Well, you may not think it's so crazy, but in the telling of who the people um, of uh, Israel are, we get used to um, recognizing um, uh, the sons of Israel, uh, beginning with the firstborn, Reuben, and they're, and they're named in birth order, basically. Except here in the census, things get a little bit wonky. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but Gad is named next to last in the first telling. Yet when the writer comes back and begins to number these folks, um, uh, the males, did, do you, did you notice that, that the women really weren't counted yeah, that continues in the New Testament, too. So, we, we count them in because in a patriarchal society, they're the ones who count. Uh, Gad then is treated in his correct birth order. So, in the beginning, it got a little out of place. Did you notice as you were reading that the Levites had not been named, that all of the descendants of Levi got left out at all. They're not even numbered in the beginning of the census. We wonder if they're going to be numbered at all, but then they get their own little section where not only are they numbered, but we find that they're given assignments. And so I want you to, I want you to appreciate, if you can, the orderliness with which God approaches God's people and asking them to be prepared to move with care and with, um, um, with attention to detail. I started to say precision. I don't know how uh, precise you can be with all of these uh, folks, but we, we've got this um, that's happening. The Levites get uh, counted later, and you are to camp in a particular way. I can't find any record that there is a reason why uh, some are named, uh, some tribes are named um, to be at the west or at the south. Um, if it's about order, the only thing that you can rec that I recognize is that they do kind of go in order. Uh, and because Aaron and Moses and Aaron's sons camp at the entrance to the tent of the meeting that would always be east uh, they are the ones who represent the Levites at the east um, I want you to imagine that rectangle in your mind and so find east um, find east from where you are and if you were in the court of the tabernacle the tent of meeting 
uh, and you were facing east, you would be inside facing the entrance to the tabernacle. And just on the other side of that, outside uh, of the tent, that's where, at a, at a short distance, that's where Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons, their relatives, would be camped. And then beyond them would be Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Uh, I didn't add those up, but I'm looking at them. They uh, are somewhere around uh, just less than 200,000 men. Okay, so we're talking about a huge camp. And just beyond where Aaron and Moses and the uh, to the entrance of the tent of meeting would be, that's where you'd find those Israelites camped there to the east. Now, if you move around to the south, Reuben and Simeon and Gad, those are the old, three oldest of Israel's sons. And they would be at the south. Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin to the west or to behind the tent of meeting. And all three of those are Joseph's boys. To the north, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Remember, there are um, three sons that belong to the Levite clan, tribe, um, and each one of those would have been uh, either to the south or to the west or to the north. Uh, Gershon would have been behind uh, along with uh, Joseph's boys. They would have been closest to the tent of meeting itself. Um, the Kohathites would have been at the south, there with Reuben and Simeon and Gad. Remember, the Levites would have been closest to the tent of meeting, the others beyond that. And the Merari uh, clan of this um, Levite uh, tribe would have been to the north. And again, so there's a layer of Levites around all four sides, just like there are layers then of Israelite households around all four sides, God smack dab in the middle. Now, when we think back, do you, do you understand now how it would be tempting for Israelites, it, so many, to make sacrifice in the open field, wanting to do the right thing by God, but thinking, oh, I don't want to have to walk in to church again. Now, we can't understand any of that, can we? <laughs> so here we are. God is ordering them, not just how to organize camp so that you know who you are. We know uh, we're ready for work. It's about organization, but also preparedness, because now we are about to start moving. We know that because we've got the scriptures organized in front of us. But how important is it that God, down to the last detail, is telling Moses and Aaron how to prepare the Levites to care for the sanctuary of God? the place where God's presence is known to reside. Not just in clouds and in fire uh, on their arrival to Mount Sinai, but now they're about to march into an area where foreign peoples, well, indigenous peoples there are going to recognize that there is something about the God of these peoples that are walking through the land. Uh, the thing that I want to uh, pay attention to here for just a few minutes is the responsibility of the Levites. The Levites are the ones who are responsible for caring for the tent of meeting. What we're going to learn later on, uh, as they get ready to move into the land, they're going to wander a lot first, but they're going to move into the land. And the Levites are the ones who lead the procession. Did, did you hear about who goes out first? So those who are camped at the east of, um, uh, at the east or the 
head the opening of the tent of meeting, and by that not the Levites, but the but Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. When they're just moving around, you've got these first three tribes, and then the next three, Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, and then the Levites move in the middle, and then you've got those two other sections moving behind, and so hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, moving together through the land with God still in the very center of them, represented by those who serve him on behalf of the people. It's kind of interesting, don't you think, that the Levites are given to Aaron and Moses, um, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, that means if you're born into the Levite clan and you're a fella, uh, and then your job is already secured. You know what you're going to be doing. And they are dedicated uh, to um, the work of keeping, uh, helping um, Moses and Aaron, but especially when it, it, it comes to moving from one place to the next. These are the things that really interested me. Now, this is just an aside. So let me, did you, have you seen the sea cow comment? This is not the first time we've gotten it, but in the instructions about how to make the temple and in reference to curtains and things like that, the hide of the sea cow, the dugong is, um, is the larger family name for this animal we often uh, recognize as a sea cow. Now, manatees are a part of that uh, animal family, but they're not the only species. But that gives you an idea about uh, the kind of hide that they're talking about. And the dugong is, uh, used to be very prolific in the waters surrounding that Sinai Peninsula. Uh, how they got those hides at, well, we, I mean, we can kind of figure that out, but if that's what they're supposed to use, my guess is there is something special about that hide that was either valuable or durable or practical um, for them to be able to use, because that's just the way God works. And maybe what had been all three. Um, so here are the things that I, I want you to hear God give instructions about too. Much of what Aaron and Moses are doing is taking these groups of people and the Levites have been divided now into their three clans, uh, Gershonites, the Koh um, Kohathites, and the Meraris. So, and they all have uh, very specific responsibilities. Uh, the Gershonites um, are dealing with the curtains, the coverings, the ropes that would hold those or attach those. Uh, the Kohathites are dealing with all the fixtures, the utensils, the tables, the lampstand, all of those items that are used in worship. Uh, and the Meraris are dealing with the frames, the bases, the posts, the tent pegs and ropes uh, for the outside that actually hold the tent of meeting together. Uh, and so as they do their work, Mos it's because Moses and Aaron have assigned particular responsibilities, maybe for family groups or for maybe they were divided uh, among the strongest uh, men within the larger family. I, I'm not sure that we assume the 30 to 50 years of age uh, that were used to designate these folks had to do with um, strength or with maturity, but we don't know. We do know this, though, that God has said yet very specifically. You've got folks like the Kohathites who are responsible for carrying the holy things that are in the um, tent of meeting. Somebody got to get the lampstand where it's going. Somebody else has got to get the altar of incense. They are to carry these things without touching them or without looking at them. 
which seems like an impossible task, except somebody else has had the responsibility of covering those things, preparing them to be handled in such a way that they are not being disrespected or irreverently considered. So basically what God is saying is, be careful and be respectful. So there's no peeking up underneath the blankets. There's no peeking up underneath what somebody else has already prepared. When you have done your job, then it's ready for the next person to do their job. I just want to say that um, in the church today, um, most local churches, we don't have this kind of life and death reverence about the furniture or the furnishings, but we do have this territorial sense about where we are and who should be able uh, to touch things, to carry things, to move things. Uh, who decided we could do this? This is not the way we do things. We've never done it this way before. And so there is this mix of honoring tradition um, at the same time that the tradition doesn't become more important than the one the tradition is supposed to serve. And that's not us. The tradition is never about serving us, my friends. It's about serving God. So we've got, we must, if we want to have a heart that is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, for the Lord God Almighty, if we want to have a heart that is holy, H-O-L-Y, after God's own heart, then we have to remember that that new song the director wants to sing or that the young praise band leader uh, introduces us to, just because it's new doesn't mean that it's of lesser value. It depends on how we use it to serve God. The same way for using worship arts, the same way for worshiping in a different place in our church. That has been one of the biggest heartaches here at Cook's uh, is that we've not been able to be back in our sanctuary because of the closeness with which we must sit and it has not been safe. There have been plenty who have decided I'm not coming back until I'm in the sanctuary. And those folks have missed out on worship in the community of God, in the body of Christ, all because of tradition. And they have missed out on some beautiful experiences. I, I'm not pointing fingers. I, I'm not berating anybody. I'm calling us all to account for the ways that we hold tradition sometimes even higher than we do the one they're supposed to serve. Uh, those who would have been tempted, those Levites who'd been tempted to just get a peek of the lampstand, to just get a peek of the altar of incense, to just get a peek of the corner of the Ark of the Covenant out of curiosity. It's about satisfying self. I want to know. I want my favorite songs. I want my place on that pew. That's about us and not about the reverence of God. And if God has said, you're not to be close to the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the Grand Lampstand, uh, the table of in, the altar of incense, the bronze laver, if you're not to be close to that, you have been trusted with a privilege and a responsibility of helping move that to where the people of God are going next by God's direction. Shouldn't that be enough? Well, you know what they say about curiosity. Hmm. 
may we learn how to walk that fine line between knowing our responsibilities and remembering that those are for the purpose of serving God, not serving self. So it's not about power. It's not about my role or what the name of my position should have. It's about all of us working together. And it takes every Levite to serve the sanctuary, the tent of meeting, the presence of God in this place. And if that doesn't go, then the people of Israel don't go. And so in, in a turn, not only are these men who are doing the grunt work and the greatest work, they are serving God first, but in doing that, they are also serving their brothers and their sisters. Uh, one quick word. Uh, I found it very interesting that um, God is basically saying, I'm going to make a deal with you. You know how the firstborn son is supposed to be dedicated to God? Uh, but left alive, not sacrificed on the altar, but I, I want that person to be dedicated to me. The Levites become the firstborn sons, so to speak, of the Israelite people so that they do the work, they learn the craft, they know the trade, they know everything that needs to be known and they pass that along as others come to them so that others for other firstborns literal firstborns can stay with their family and pass along their knowledge their gifts for tradesmanship or workmanship and for the functioning and the thriving of God's people but there were more uh there were um more firstborns in the Israelite people than there were Levites. Well, you can jump on board and come on. Or you could pay this um, price to stay with your family and then to help the Levites um, in that gap of so many people. 273. So 273 firstborns at the time of this census. Again, two years after they've exited uh, well, they've had their exodus from Egypt. Five sanctuary shekels. And that money went to taking care of the Levites, their work, and all that they were responsible for. All of us have a part, my friends. Excuse me, and that reminds me of Paul's great teaching based on his experience of Jesus the Christ and the invitation because of salvation in Christ for Paul to understand what his role was. We are like the human body, this group, this all of us who believe in Jesus. We are the body of Christ. And while Christ is the head, we are all hands and feet, we are armpits and belly buttons. We are big toes and ring fingers. We are shoulders and spines. And we are the life-giving organs to this body. And some parts are respected because they're seen and we know what their work is like. You ask our friend Dennis what it's like being without uh, the use of a shoulder while he's waiting for his shoulder to heal, then you know how important a shoulder is. Or you ask any one of us who've stumped our big toe as we've gotten up in the night what it's like to limp around with a, a half-present big toe. Mm -hmm. Every one of us has an important role in the body of Christ. And when we fail to take that seriously, when we fail to do our job, when we don't do it with the right attitude, whether we think more highly of ourselves or we don't think highly of ourselves at all, then the work of the body is compromised. How is it that you should see your role in the body of Christ today? What, what role do you have, not in your local church, 
but as a member of the people of God. This uh, encouragement that you offer one another as we gather for a few minutes, uh, four mornings a week, when you offer prayers for one another, when you offer encouragement one, to one another, when you greet one another with the joy of the Lord, that's part of your work. Do you do the same thing with the people who are in your local church family? Are you caring for one another? Are you studying? I consider what we do as we study together um, a fulfilling of our role. Too, to know the things of God and to challenge myself constantly by asking, am, am I living that way? Is it up here and in my heart? Because if it's just up here, it's not really my truth yet. All of this from the organization of God's people because it takes us all moving together. As we get ready to start this new season, and that's what self-examination, denial of self, uh, ridding ourselves of the world so that there's more room for God, that's all the work of the written season. Maybe today as we anticipate that, eat you a pancake or two, listen to some Zydeco music, uh, consider yourself right in the heart of Mardi Gras as we are thankful for all that God has done for us. Uh, in this uh, past year, not calendar year, but you know, in this past year that we might begin intentionally this season as we head toward the cross with Christ to think about our own discipleship. Am I different than I was this time last year? What have I learned? How am I more mature? I do I understand the job that's been assigned to me. Am I willing to do it with some serious intent? I'm going to be thinking about that for myself. I'm going to be praying that all of us would be courageous. Matter of fact, let's start with asking God on behalf of all of those who gather with us today that we might hear our instructions and know our place and celebrate that we all have a place by God's design and by the immeasurable grace of the one who is our creator our Redeemer and our Sustainer. Lord God, I thank you right now that it is the intent of your heart that your kingdom make room for everyone who loves you, who understands they've been called according to your purpose, that we carry the divine image, each one of us, and that our work is crucial to this kingdom. There's not a hierarchy that we have to attend to, yet we are called to respect and love and extend grace to and understand, work toward understanding of everyone who's in the same place we are. Forgive us when we've not taken seriously or when we've been afraid of this place you make for us, one that carries authority and power, not of our own, but you have given it to us. Just like Jesus sending out the 70 or sending out the 12, it's not with our own power and authority that we go anywhere, do anything. It is yours that you have entrusted to us. And we've been so afraid many times to wield it that it won't be enough, that our family and friends won't understand that we've just done nothing with it at all. Forgive us for not pulling our weight. Forgive us for grumbling about our jobs. Forgive us, oh God. Oh, for not trusting your design, your organization, your call on our lives, individually and corporately. Help us grow in our understanding that when we shirk our responsibility, the work of your whole kingdom is threatened. Now, I know your power is greater and your will will not be thwarted. But oh, how I long for all of us to be a part of that. And that will mean stepping in oh, to some less than comfortable 
responsibilities. I thank you for the hard work of those men who carried your tabernacle from place to place, who respected their responsibility, who trusted those who prepared their work before them to have done it properly, and those who went headlong into those responsibilities as they prepared, they didn't know, to wander in the wilderness, carrying you with them everywhere they went. Teach us, Lord, to do the same that the largest part of our work is carrying you with us. Now, we know you go with us, that you're present with us always. But what a difference it makes for us to go hand in hand, heart to heart, than it does to feel like I've got you in my back pocket. Thank you, God, for your patience, for your understanding. But thank you, too, that you trust each one of us to be your partners in the building of this holy kingdom. For creating us in your image. For redemption that costs you so much. And that we take for granted. For your sustenance and your nourishment all along the way. That we might grow in our understanding and conviction of who and whose we are. We are grateful. In the name of the one who gave himself for us, we pray. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. My friends, it's been good to be with you this morning. Thanks for letting us run over just a little bit. Oh, what an important thing we do for one another when we stand with one another. So keep praying. I will see you soon. Bye.